Coming all the way from Washington, D.C., which I did yesterday, so I very much appreciate it because I know what that feels like. We have, he's a partner and founder at, at And Partners. He spent two years at U.S. Digital Services serving as Executive Creative Director and Director of Common Platforms, and is a veteran design executive who worked for numerous brands like Ralph Lauren, DG Dems, and the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Please welcome Eduardo Ortiz. All right, good morning. So my notes are between my phone, which is where I wrote the talk, and this pad, which is where I started transcribing the notes because I hate when I see someone giving a talk out of a phone because I never know, are they checking email? Are they like tweeting about this? Or what exactly are they doing? Uh, I'm actually reading the notes. Um, let's see if I can figure this out faster than Shaney. Look at that, I did. Uh, this is a quote by uh, Judge Dana Sabra, uh, who is the federal judge who has been overseeing most of the litigations dealing with family separations, which is what we're going to be talking about for the next nine and a half minutes here. <clears throat> In early 2018, the current administration decided to start separating families under the advisement that if they separated the children from the adults, they could provide better care for the children. I spent two years at the USDS, most of that focused on immigration reform. So I actually do believe that. When you assign the children to Health and Human Services, who has the administration for children and families, and their family reunification program, they actually get better care. But when a family is together to separate them under the guise of, oh, the children by themselves are going to get better care, it just doesn't really stand up to any kind of questioning. In and sure enough, questioning came, and in May of 2018, let's see if this is the next slide, and I'm hitting the wrong button. In May of 2018, the administration decided to one-up it and institute a zero-tolerance policy, which meant that any kind of family that came, that came uh, through the southwest border was separ being separated. In June, that went to the courts. Judge Sabra, who was overseeing it, was like, yeah, this is not going to fly. You need to, re you need to stop this. You need to reunify the families and figure out how to provide services from that standpoint. So due to political pressure and everything else that happened, the administration stopped their zero tolerance policy and started reunifying families. But before that happened, 3,000 children had been separated from their families. Over 100 of those were under the age of five. And now, you could, as a human being, as a sentient being, you could very quickly be like, wait, what? We were separating families? Over 100 of those were under the age of five? Over 30 of those were merely a few months old? gets challenging all of a sudden to try to actually understand what exactly the administration was trying to do. But before everything else was said and done, the actual number came out to be 11,500. That is the number that included not just the children that came with their families, but also the children whose families de decided to self-deport at the border in order to try to give the, the, the children a, an opportunity, if you will. And this is also where the tech piece of this conversation gets started, for those of you starting to feel a little bit antsy. <laughs> so if we start considering how it all happened, 
we start to identify that there are two organizations, the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Health and Human Services, that are at the forefront of both family reunification and family separation. Homeland Security has always been on the family separation front. They are a law enforcement organization. Health and Human Services has been on the family reunification front. They provide services to families and individuals. And in one of the reasons that it became so chaotic is because the administration issued a policy without talking to either of them. So a process that had been pretty straightforward for them, in reality, became a little bit convoluted. So this is, at a glance, what the process of anyone coming into the United States and having an interaction with Customs and Border uh, Protection looks like at least from the southwest border. They're coming from the southwest border. They're either met, oh, I guess I have a thing here. They're either met by field operations, meaning uh, not at a uh, port of entry, or they are met by immigration and customs enforcement, or the other one, which I chose not to list out because it didn't help my story, uh, the blue shirts from the CBP, which are the ones that we also encounter at the airports. So if you've ever traveled internationally and had to give your password to someone, those blue shirts, that's what they call themselves, uh, are also uh, CBP. From there, we have uh, whether they are required to appear and or their release has been granted, whether they engage with the Office of Refugee uh, uh, Resettlement, whether they engage with enforcement and removal operations or the Family Reunification Center, uh, or if they are removed. So this is CBP. This is ICE. This is the Department of Justice. This is both ICE and CBP. This is ICE. This is HHS, CBP, and ICE. Each and every single one of them has an office called the Family Reunification Center. All three of them do different things. <coughs> so you start looking through the process, and all of a sudden, you're like, wait, how are they supposed to figure out exactly what it is that they, that they need to do and how they need to do it? Well, that is a great question, and one that would have been better answered before the policy was put into place, one could argue. <laughs> and this is what the process looks like. And I won't bore you with it, especially because it is quite challenging. But you have a number of human touch points. You have a number of forms and interactions that happen uh, with, with people. Then you have a number of offices and engagements that need to happen. And Finally, you have this position. That pretty much, at a glance, is our immigration process when it comes to anyone requ requiring asylum under the credible fear uh, of death or persecution uh, section of the law. So the administration was given until July to reunify families by August, by October, the administration had failed. And they came back to the courts and told them that there were 120 families pending reunification and that 171 of those were deemed ineligible for reunification. If you are maybe thinking like, oh, cool, maybe Eduardo's going to tell us what ineligible means, I can't because the administration hasn't said that. That is actually currently in the courts trying to figure out what is it that the administration means by a family being ineligi ineligible for reunification. So we get back to what should be a straightforward process, which wasn't. And it gets into why we're talking about this policy uh, specifically. We're talking about this po policy specifically because this is a flawed policy that makes it easy to illustrate the statement that the sign is political. I'm known for going into a room and telling everyone in the room that they are a designer. Because being a designer is the act of making decisions, whether informed or not. Ideally, you are informed before you make those decisions. But it often happens that decisions are made without 
having any understanding of what the consequences are. But do not be fooled. Consequences, whether intended or not, are still consequences. When we talk about the user-centered design, human-centered design, user experience, or any of the labels that designers decide to use, well, it actually matters. When you're talking about a human being and what happens to the human being, design becomes even more critical. And the reason why design is political is that if you've been in a room doing any kind of workshop, any kind of design presentation, you will notice very quickly that if there's a designer leading that, that conversation, there's nowhere for you to hide. It doesn't matter how small you make yourself. It doesn't matter that you have a 17-inch screen laptop and you try hiding behind it. You're going to get called on. It doesn't matter, especially if there are sticky notes, especially if there are sticky notes. So we know that the act of getting people to the table, of engaging with people, is a political act. And that, in essence, is what design is. So because no one can stand on the sidelines and because everyone has to be involved, when you have people that are engaged in the conversation, that understand what the consequences are instead of ignoring them, then you end up with better results. And this is kind of like where we come in and what I wanted to share with you. When the news broke in June about this happening, I reached out to a bunch of people that I had no business reaching out to, asking, hey, there's a problem. And I know for a fact that the administration is not going to be able to put together a process to undo this. I knew this because for two years, I had been trying to map out the system. And for two years, I generated this. This is only one of the processes. And this is like a well thought out process. So if we think about a process that was asked to be put in place overnight, you get into a less than ideal situation. So what we did was we, as people started responding, as people started engaging, we started interviewing people to try to understand what could we do. Basically, we started defining what the problem statement was. Once we defined what the problem statement was, and once we knew what our capabilities were, we were able to start talking to people and to understand what were the pain points and what were the challenges that they were facing. So we knew that we were not going to have the government support. But at the Southwest border, there's an amazing humanitarian effort by tons of organizations, nonprofits, trying to help the communities. So we knew that those were our stakeholders. We engaged with them. That feedback that we got from them, we put it into a visual format to help us understand exactly what was being said and try to prioritize information. From there, we created prototypes of physical forms, of spaces for the community to interact in, of digital tools. And we went back to them, because this is cyclical, to make sure that what we were creating wasn't being created in a vacuum, which happens often. And for those of you wondering, like, oh, how did you do this? And where was the money? Well, the last question is easier. There was no money. Uh, the first one uh, for how did we do this, we, the engineers that we were working with very quickly made decisions as to what needed to happen. They decided that they were going to use uh, the Google Cloud because it was the, the most uh, accessible. They were going to use a Google App Engine in order to run the whole stack. And on top of it, they were going to use WordPress with bespoke code because nothing like this existed. And the same thing happened with the designers. We all agreed exactly on what was going to be done and how. Actually, just kidding. We, the first day, we started arguing about using either posted brands or knockoff brands, so <laughs> designers. And this is the team. We ended up with nine engineers, 13 designers and researchers, five product managers, three content strategists, and a lot of lawyers. 
And this illustrates the need for a team, for understanding context. While we can all allude to understanding information, there's nothing as valuable as someone that is actually an expert in their field. So having a lawyer in the room, having a content strategist, content strategist in the room, a policymaker, what have you, is critical when you're trying to make sure that what you're creating can actually help solve problems. Most importantly, every single one of these people were volunteers. Uh, and I mean volunteers because no one got paid. Uh, in the end, we were able to put together a system uh, in partnership with, uh, with New America and that was sent down to the southwest border to help the folks that were there, the, <clears throat> the social workers, the, the lawyers that, that were there, and the different organizations that were there to try to reunify families. And this was important because a system like this could have and should have been done by the government if time had been taken to actually understand what were the consequences, which is where you all come into play. You are all designers. You are all charged with providing services to your constituency based on rules, legislation, laws, what have you. And understanding what exactly it is that you need to provide and how is the first step to being able to provide something that is uh, technologically sound because understanding is the most important thing. I'm happy to answer any questions after this so that Bill doesn't keep pointing at his watch for me. Uh, but I will be outside after this and glad to share more about this or any of the other work that we have done. Thank you for your time.